I don't want the religious person in the lab telling me that God is responsible for what it is they cannot discover. Because look at the hubris of that. You're in the lab, and you say, I don't know how this works. And not only that, no one alive on earth knows how this works. And not only that, no one who will ever be born will know how this works. That's kind of audacious when you think about it. And then you put it down and go on to the next problem. This problem is a cure for Alzheimer or, or cancer or whatever else. I don't want them in the science classroom. And so the issue is simply about progress and discovery. And in my recent forays into Washington, well, I've been closer to a community of Republicans than I've ever been in my life, because I grew up in New York City. And in New York City, it's, I think that person is Republican back there. You see? The, <laughs> No, not that one, the one behind that person. Yeah, that's a Republican. <laughs> There's another one, that's in New York. That, so you grow up this way, and I get sort of baptized into a Republican administration. I had two consecutive appointments in the Bush administration, one on aerospace, on the aerospace industry, and one on uh, space exploration, the NASA's future, basically. And I realized something, spending that much time in the community of powerful Republicans, that Republicans, above all else, do not want to die poor. So, there's a limit to how far this will go. And I bet most people in this room, even those assembled at this table, were highly concerned about the Dover trial, wondering how that would turn. And I looked at that and I said, I'm not worried, because it's a Republican judge. And in the end, if you put people who are not making discoveries in the science classroom, that is the end of the foundation of your future economy. And so I had a little more confidence than others did because of this uh, uh, sensitivity to the, the money aspect of it. But we all know tomorrow's economies will be founded on, uh, on, on innovations in science and technology, and of course that gets cut short if uh, we lose our civilization, as what happened in Islam in 1100. And the last thought I'll leave you with, which concerns me greatly, if you do the math, okay, you know, just look, you look at all the Nobel Prize winners there ever were, some even in this room, and ask how many were Muslim? And it's like one, maybe two, okay? I think a second one was in economics, and the one we referred to was uh, an, uh, described earlier, the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Professor Weinberg, uh, Abdus Salam. And he's not Middle Eastern Muslim, he's Pakistani Muslim, <clears throat> okay? Now, how many Nobel Prizes are won by Jews? It's like the fourth of the Nobel Prizes, okay? Some high fraction of the total. And then you look, how many Muslims are there in the world? It's like a billion Muslims. How many Jews? 15 million tops, okay? So you to ratio these numbers, had Islam not collapsed in its intellectual standing in the year 1100, and you just do the ratios, they would have every single Nobel Prize today. So the fact that it's not only just a few, it's near zero, it is deeply worrying. I'm concerned about what lost, what, 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 what brilliance may have expressed itself and did not in that community over the past thousand years. You look at the chemical ingredients of life itself. Put them in order, in, in rank order. You get hydrogen, which comes from the water molecule. You get oxygen, which comes from the water molecule. You get carbon. It's the foundation of our chemistry. You get nitrogen, in order. And the next one is the most famous element of them all. It's on every single list. It's called other. Okay, so hydrogen, <laughs> oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Now you go, let's, that's, in, that's in life. Now let's turn to the universe and say, hey, universe, what do you have ranked among your elements? What's number one for you? Hydrogen. What's number two? Helium. Well, if you remember from chemistry class, helium is inert. You couldn't do anything with it chemically even if you tried. So let's skip that. Next in the universe, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. Other, thank you. So, we are one for one the same ingredients in the universe, which itself is a bit humbling. If we were made of an isotope of bismuth, then you'd have an argument. You'd say, hey, we're, we're rare stuff. Come here, check us out. Look at where we are, all right? And, but like, no, no. We're made of the most common ingredients of the universe. But those ingredients are traceable to the actions 
of high mass stars that forge these elements in their core, destabilized, exploded, spread their enriched ingredients, their guts across the galaxy, creating environments where the next generation of stars will have the ingredients that can then make planets and people. And so not only are we in this universe, the universe is in us. And I know of no more enlightening, ennobling, enriching thought than that. And that is the thought I'll leave you with this evening. Thank you for your attention. Napoleon, if you visited his library, it's not just sort of books of world history and battles. It's engineering books. It's physics books. This man wanted to know where his cannonballs would land, all right? He was much more than just sort of a lucky general. He was into the physics, the engineering, and the material science of war. And so he immediately summoned up the five-volume production of Laplace, read it through, cover to cover, called in Laplace, and said, Sir, I have the exact quote here. Uh, hang on. Uh, shoot. Uh, Napoleon asked him what role God played in the construction and regulation of the heavens. This is kind of like, that's what Newton would ask, right? Laplace replies, sir, I had no need for that hypothesis. And so what concerns me now is, even if you're as brilliant as Newton, you reach a point where you start basking in the majesty of God, and then your discovery stops. It just stops. You're kind of no good anymore for advancing that frontier, waiting for somebody else to come behind you who doesn't have God on the brain, and who says, that's a really cool problem, I want to solve it. They come in and solve it. But look at the time delay. This was a hundred year time delay. And the math that's in perturbation theory is like crumbs for Newton. He could have come up with that. The guy invented calculus just on a dare, practically. When someone asked him, why, why you, know, you know, Ike, how come planets orbit in ellipses and not some other shape? And he couldn't answer that. He goes home for two months, comes back, out comes integral differential calculus, because he needed that to answer that, to answer that question. And so, so this, is, this is the kind of mind we were dealing with with Newton. He could have gone there, but he didn't. He didn't. His religiosity stopped him. And so we're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is science is a philosophy of discovery, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. I don't need to see whether, I don't need, have you discovered anything lately? If not, get out of the science classroom. But I'm not going to say, don't teach this, because it's, it's real, it happened. So I don't want people to sweep it under the rug, because if you do, you're neglecting something fundamental that's going on in people's minds when they confront things they don't understand. And it happens to the greatest of the minds as it happens to everyone else, many, if not most other people in the public. However, if what you believe is demonstrably false and you want to pass it off as true in a science classroom, I have an issue with that. If you want to say it in the religion class, fine. In the belief system class, fine. In the history of human thought class, fine. And I don't, I don't know how many of you, I've managed to get like a little letter to the editor in the New York Times a month ago. Do you remember that case in New Jersey where there was the, the middle school student who re tape recorded the history teacher saying that the students will burn in hell if they don't believe in Jesus Christ? Do you remember that? And it became a whole hullabaloo in the district and it would say separation of church and state, this is a violation of the, the First Amendment or Second Amendment, whichever amendment, okay? First Amendment, separation of church and state. And everybody got up on the American Civil Liberties Union, everybody's jumping arms about separating church and state. And I'm saying, and by the, among the statements made by this teacher were that the Big Bang and evolution were not scientific theories and that Noah's Ark carried dinosaurs. Now, <laughs> so, at some point, I said, I can't keep listening to this. And I wrote a really short letter. Short letters are the best, I think. And all I said was, after two other letters 
rambling on about keeping religion out of the school because of the amendment in the Constitution, I said, this is not an issue of the separation of church and state. No, you got that wrong. This is an issue of the separation of ignorant, scientifically illiterate people from the ranks of school teachers. <laughs> so why, why, why am I even going here? Because I'm trying to explain to you that the, you fast forward, the, the dangers here is that what, you fast forward to 21st century America and ask, what influences do we, are we feeling now? Because that, per, that naming period in Islam stopped and, and it never recovered. Because the, 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 the way of thinking about the natural world, revelation replaced investigation. Okay? So I fast forward to 20, 21st century and what do you find? You get things like this. Okay? This is in America. All right? So now, what I find interesting is it's the, it's the level of passion that it requires to actually do it. You gotta like pay for this, okay? And it means a lot of people pissed off at the Big Bang. They're pissed off at the Big Bang. At, at our museum in New York, the American Museum of Natural History, they come to the Big Bang exhibit, and sometimes I don't feel like having that conversation. I say, why don't you go to our hall of human biology first, and then come to us. And that's where we have sort of monkeys holding hands with people in skeleton forms, and then they never make it back to the Big Bang. <laughs> They're gone forever. <laughs> okay. So however egregious the Big Bang is, monkeys and people is a, is a worse agree, is a, is a worse transgression, apparently. Consider not long ago when so much of the Western world was the state was the religion. And we have actually moved quite a distance from that compared with 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, the era of the Inquisition and this sort of thing. And so, so to say that it has such a grip, it has a fraction of the grip that it once did on the operations of human conduct and of society. So the real question is, if implicit in that is, given what we know of science, why would religion still have any grip at all? Not to, why does it still have a big grip? Because it's not a big grip when you look um, in, the, in the, the developed world. So, in fact, most of Europe are just, they're, you know, they're whole countries where religion has essentially disappeared entirely. And the countries are not, the, the countries are not full of violence and, you know, it's just the assumption that you have to be religious to be moral is a false one. It's empirically false because you just look around in places where that's the case. So, um, So, so, so that's one fact, and we pull away from that a little. There's plenty of what goes on in religious texts that has tremendous value to how to think about life and how to treat one another. Uh, in fact, uh, Jefferson created what was essentially what you can think of as the Jeff Thomas Jefferson, the Jefferson Bible. I don't know if you ever heard of this. He went through the Bible, and I think both the Old and the New, Testament, and he crossed off everything that was sort of mythical, magical, uh, things that clearly violated known laws of nature, and kept the rest and said, here is the, the stuff of the Bible that will, should have value to any modern person going forward. If you look at people who are religious today who are not in conflict with science, they have viewed their religious text as a spiritual something that gives them spiritual support, not as a science textbook. The, the, inter, the, the conflict in society is when you have those who are still religious, who want to use their religious text as their access point to understanding the natural world. And persistent efforts of the past to make that happen have just simply failed. The, the, the Bible does not work as a science textbook. In fact, Galileo knew this, and he himself was a religious man. He's famously quoted as saying, the Bible tells you how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. <laughs> so on that scale, 
the, the, the conflict comes about when that subset of the religious community feels threatened by scientific discoveries that are different from how they interpret what should the natural world should be in the Bible. I think, I think it's that point where you get to the concept of the God of the gaps. The, the, you go, we do not understand this. You know, science takes us so far, but we don't understand anything beyond that. Therefore, that's God. Hmm. The stuff that we don't get, that's God. And the trouble with that is the moment that you actually go, no, we do understand that now. Is people are going, well, did God just go away then? And, and it goes back, you know, nice simple things like the rainbow. The point where you go, well, the rainbow actually, it's, it's an optical effect. It's not something magic that gets put up in the sky to memorialize the flood. Plus, did you know that everyone sees a unique rainbow? No. That's right. Um, the rainbow is an optical effect for the person who sees it. So if you stand 10 feet to my left, you see an actual, a different rainbow than I see. It's a remarkable, uh, fun fact about rainbows. My, my, yeah. my, fa my favorite fun fact about rainbows is the fact that they were originally believed to have six color bands, but that Newton added, added indigo and violet. Yeah, Newton liked, to, he liked, he liked his seven. the number seven. He had yeah. the mystical feeling for the number seven. Throws in indigo that no one else sees. Yeah, nobody, I mean, yeah. hands up here, who actually goes, indigo, violet, there's the indigo. You yeah, don't, yeah. you just go, Purple. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the exactly. blue, purple. But oh, so another thing about the rainbow, because each rainbow is unique to the viewer, it can only be a rainbow that is exactly face on to you. You've never seen a rainbow that was like at an oblique angle. Think about it. They're exactly hemispherical in front of you. That's why you can never get to the base of the rainbow. Because that would mean your perspective on it would change. That's what makes it a good place to hide the gold, okay? <laughs> In case you didn't know. All right. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you outing yourself here as an unbeliever in leprechauns? <laughs> People have been burned at stakes. For indeed that. am. Um, and uh, another thing, just uh, you mentioned the God of the gaps. In, in a free society, a free pluralistic society, where the freedom of the expression of religion is constitutionally protected, which is a fundamental part of why America was so attractive to immigrants from around the world whose religious differences were not being supported in their hometown. I will never be one to tell you what you should believe or what you should not believe. What I will say is that if you want to say that where we don't understand things, that's where God rests, that's where God operates, the God of the gaps argument. Because I get asked that all the time. What was around before the universe? I don't know. Must have been something, God. So they got to stick in God where we're not there yet. And I just say, well, I got, we got top people working on that. That's, it's a current frontier. We're not there yet. And given the history of the moving frontier, where people had previously said, well, God must be operating, we're long past that. We, those explanations have come, and so I, I don't, there's no compelling reason to say God did it and then sort of give up and go on to the next problem. My issue with the God of the gaps is that if you feel that way, you should not be writing the science curriculum of a classroom, okay? That's all, okay? Because if you do, you are undermining the very process of what science is all about. Because the God of the Gaps principle is like a, it's a philosophy of ignorance, whereas science is a philosophy of discovery. And that's an important distinction between the two. And if you remove that foundation for what builds science, you are undermining the capacity of your culture, of your nation, to compete technologically in this, the 21st century. So it is not without consequence to have conduct of that way. You go around the world and you find times and places where nations have excelled in one subject or another. There's a birth of that period of, of where they excel and then there's a peak and sometimes it drops off and sometimes they hang on. And so you can ask the culture of that. What was going on in that nation to support those discoveries? And then what happened when they ended? 
And so I, I call that sort of naming rights. If you were there first and you did it best, you name things. Particle physics uh, in this country, in the United States, was like going gangbusters after the Second World War. And, and the discovery of atomic elements, look at the periodic table. There's Berkelium, Californium, you know, we got half the United States up there in the upper, heavier elements of the periodic table. Uh, am I right there? Sir, Sir Weinberg. No, I don't want to. That's, that's not because the world liked California or Berkeley. It's because the work was done here. It's because there was, a, there was a, um, an effort to excel in just those subjects. And it shows up in other ways. Well, I'll give you just briefly. You know, um, part of the naming rights is that you don't have to name it. So, for example, while we didn't invent the Internet, we certainly exploited it here in America. We did that sort of first and best. And so your email address does not end in .us. Everybody else is in the world. they got to say what country they came from. We don't. Okay? It's, it's simple, but it's, it's the consequence of being there first and doing it better than anyone had done it before. Do you know that the British postage stamp is the only postage stamp in the world that does not identify the country of origin? Because they invented postage stamps. So why should they have to say what country it is? It's their invention. Okay? Check them out. It's, a, it's, it's just the facts of this. The constellations of the night sky. We, it's the Greek and Roman, and it's lasted to this time. Because they did a really good job thinking that stuff up. All the mythologies of the heavens, that really stuck with us. All right. So... I'm going to make a larger point, um, not to get gratuitous on you here, but September 11, 2001, uh, as we all know, this was going on uh, in New York City. Uh, this is the view outside of my window. I live four blocks from ground zero. Excuse me, this is the corner of the building in which I live. I went outside to get this view. I was, at the time, judging whether I should go collect my daughter who was in an elementary school two blocks north of the North Tower. North is to the right in this picture. So I wanted to get a closer view with a highly magnified uh, zoom lens to see what, while that was happening, the plane flew into the South Tower. And so no one was thinking terrorism until the second one was hit. The first one was just sort of a bad tragedy. And so these are just three frames from my camcorder. This is at t equals zero. This is one second, well, like actually a fraction of a second. The plane was moving probably 500 miles an hour. And just to understand, the black building, that black sort of monolithic building, that is 50 stories tall. This is New York City, people. So tall buildings are kind of, they're just all over the place. And that's just a hotel, a 50-story hotel. And it's, the, the, the towers are foreshortened because they're the angle at which this is shown. I put these up because a few days after this, President Bush... I don't remember where he said this, on the steps of the White House, in the Rose Garden or at the Capitol, in an attempt to distinguish we from they, the terrorists who flew these planes into the buildings and into the, uh, uh, that went down in Pennsylvania and at the, at, in Washington, to distinguish we from they, he loosely quotes a phrase out of